personal ways. So I'm praying that God would give us revelation today to unearth some of the areas that maybe we've been operating in that, that we didn't even know what the root of that was pride. This, and this is here. I said it last week, but I'll say it again this week since it's the topic. Pride is the manifestation of demonic wisdom. It is. Pride is the manifestation. It, has, it's, it's, it is the epitome of earthly wisdom. That arrogance and pride and ego, egotism. It was found in Lucifer. And it was the reason why he was cast out of heaven. I'm, I got that scripture for you. Ezekiel chapter 27. God says, your heart. He's talking to Lucifer. Your heart became proud on the account of your beauty. Lucifer, for those of you that don't know, Lucifer was an angel before he was cast out of heaven and became Satan. A demon, you know, he was, he, was, he was the worship leader in heaven. Built into his body were instruments of worship. The Bible says he was beautiful and he was filled with splendor and majesty and God made him that way. And God is saying, your heart became proud on the account of the beauty I gave you. Some of you need to start thinking, God, you don't have that problem. I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. That was, come on now. And you corrupted, look at this, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you out of heaven. God, listen to this. God can never entrust his kingdom to someone who has not been broken from the spirit of pride. Because, because pride is the armor of darkness itself. Are you hearing me today? You, you, if you want to be entrusted with the things of God, the kingdom of God, the authority of of God. God can never entrust his kingdom to people who have not been broken from the spirit of pride because the spirit of pride in itself is an armor of darkness. Pride is called by a lot of teachers of the Bible. It's called the utmost evil because everything, every false and evil behavior, action, or thought stems from the root of pride in our life. So the Bible has a lot to say about, about it. It, it. It says that it causes a lot of different problems in life. Go to your notes, and I want to give you some areas that pride is causing havoc in our lives. Write them down. Number one, pride prevents me from growing. Pride will prevent me from growing. When I, when I think I have it all together, I have no motivation to grow right? I have no motivation to change. I have no motivation to develop myself when I think I'm fine and I got it all together. When your head is swelling, your mind stops growing. I, and I guarantee you this, if you think you don't need this message, you're the one who needs it, okay? If you think like, oh, this one's not for me. I'm good here. No, no, no. This message is for you, okay? You need to perk it up. Proverbs chapter 26 says, there is more hope for a fool than for a man who is wise in his own eyes. He's talking about the pride of, of denial, the pride of denying that I have any weaknesses at all. Someone said, if I knew my faults, I'd be glad to work on them, Pastor, but I just can't think any of them right now. That is the attitude of pride right there. Proverbs 10, anyone willing to be corrected is on the pathway to life, and anyone refusing has lost his chance. So, so check it out. The way that we respond to criticism pretty much depends on the way we respond to praise. If, if praise humbles us, then criticism will build us up. But if praise inflates us, then criticism will crush us. Okay? And, and both of those responses will destroy you. You will be defeated by either one of those responses. Another reason why pride prevents us from growing is it'll keep, uh, uh, it'll keep us from getting help. So if I'm having marriage issues and marriage problems, I'm not going to let you know because I have pride. If I'm having financial difficulties, I'm not going to ask for help because of my pride. If I'm not cutting it as a parent or if I'm having trouble at work, I don't want you knowing that stuff because of my, my pride. So it prevents us from getting help and growing. One of the ways that you can tell if you've got pride operating in your life is you, get, you ask yourself, am I teachable? Am I teachable? Am I still teachable? Some of us would rather look wise than be wise, which is foolish. Some, some of us would rather look wise than be wise. And the way you become wise is by being humble. I know this series is aggravating a lot of you guys, and you're thinking a lot and think, okay, I'm sorry. Here's number two. 
Number two, this is what pride, pride messes us up, and it causes a lot of problems. Here it is. The second one is, is it poisons my relationships. Pride poisons my relationships. It is the root of all conflict and disharmony and disunity in every relationship that has it. It is the root. So when we act out of pride, we tend to be demanding and unsympathetic and I'm going to have it my way and, and only my, my way is the right way. And when we're prideful, we can become obnoxious. We become rude. Have you ever seen a prideful person ordering at a restaurant? Yeah. Yeah. How, sometimes when I'm, when, when I meet with other pastors or leaders, or, or sometimes when I'm like going through hiring process, I'll go to a restaurant and I'll, and I'll see how they treat the waitress or the waiter. I'm watching them. I'm watching how they'll, how they'll treat them, how they're going to tip, because you can tell a lot about someone who treats someone who's supposed to be there to serve them or help them. How they're prideful people. They're demanding. They hold grudges. They keep score. They're unsympathetic. They explode in anger when they're criticized, and they never want to admit they're wrong. They can't apologize. Pride destroys relationships. Proverbs 13 and 10 says that pride only brings fight. Pride only brings quarrels in your life. When my pride is in competition with your pride, there's going to be a clash. There's going to be a clash. And, and I'm telling you, the root of so many marriage problems is plain old pride. It's I just don't want to admit that you're partially right. I just don't want to admit that. No, no, no. I am right, fully right. You're wrong. I don't want to just give any ground. That is pride. Matthew chapter 7, verse 5. Jesus says, take the log out of your own eye first, and then you'll be able to see. I want, you to, I want to make sure you get this. So we're going to need to read this out loud together, okay? Let's read this together, all right? From the top, one, two, three. Take the log out of your eye first, and then you will be able to see. That part, one more time. Ready? Go. Take the log out of your eye first, then you will be able to see. See, the problem with pride is you got, you got so much junk in your own eye that it's affecting how you see other people. And so the thing that you're judging and condemning and criticizing in other people isn't even the reality. It's the junk in your own. You're seeing everything through the lens of your log instead of the lens of God's word, instead of through the lens of his spirit, instead of the lens of Christ, you, got, you, you haven't dealt with your own stuff, and so it affects the way you see and the way you judge and criticize. And, and your, it's an interesting twist on this statement. He says, then you'll be able to take that speck out of your brother's eye. This, the word that Jesus used for speck and log come from the same root word in, in, in the language he was using, meaning it can, he, Jesus is saying it's the same substance, the same substance. In other words, Jesus is saying that the reason some people are so good at finding fault in other people's lives is because they're so familiar with it themselves. Are you hearing me today? That they can spot certain things in another person's life because they are guilty of the same thing themselves, sometimes even in greater measure. Sometimes the people that are nitpicking the sins of others, others are, are guilty of even worse sins than themselves. But if we know anything about being forgiven by God, then we will be forgiven people. For, forgiven people forgive people. Can I get an amen? amen? Proverbs chapter 30. There are those who are pure in their own eyes. No, 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 no. You're, I'm right. I, I have the right thought. I have the right idea. My opinion. My, uh, no, no. Those are those, there are those who are pure in their own eyes, who will not give any ground, who will not compromise, who will not partially, who don't know how to say, I'm sorry. There are those who are pure in their own eyes and yet are not cleansed of their filth. When I refuse to admit that I'm part of the problem, then, then it causes pride that harms and poisons my relationships. You want to know the key to reconciliation? You want, when, your, when your relationships are just being poisoned and affected and dysfunctional, you want to know the key to reconciling those things? Swallow your pride. Swallow your pride. I'm telling you, it's a low-calorie diet. It ain't going to hurt you. Swallow your pride. It's good for you. It's, here's another problem. Another problem is that it produces stress and anxiety. Pride produces stress and anxiety. You worry too much about 
our image and how do I look and what are people thinking about me and what are they saying about me? One of the symptoms of pride, like we talked about earlier, is perfectionism. That you have to have everything perfect. And, and the stress of that is eating you up. Proverbs 29 says, It is dangerous to be concerned with what others think of you. Some of, some of us are just way too concerned of the opinions of other people. And even the decisions that we make in life, we don't even know. But the, a lot of the decisions that we're making in life come from, we're making it because we want to appease other people. We want to please them. We want to, we want to uh, endear ourselves to them. We want to make someone else happy. And we don't even know that we're making those decisions and direction in our life because of that reason. That's why pride causes so much depression, too. Uh, because if I try to live one image, but inside I'm different and they don't match, I'm going to be depressed. I'm, I mean, I may be able to fool you, but I can't fool me. And pride causes that discouragement, depression, and dis- disillusionment. But Jesus says this. Jesus says in Matthew 5.5, 5, Jesus says, happy are the humble. That's the title of my message today. Happy are the humble. Humility is a mark of emotionally healthy people. Pride is the mark of emotionally insecure people. If I have to prove something to you, it means that I'm insecure on the inside. Emotionally healthy people aren't concerned about status, image, ego. They find their satisfaction in other places. They don't care what you think, okay? So if you're going to live a life marked by wisdom... You're going to have to learn to walk in humility. So today I want to teach you. I want to teach you how to learn how to develop humility and position your life for wisdom and revelation. With humility comes wisdom. So let me give you some keys. Let me give you some keys to humility today. Write these down. Number one, if you want to develop humility and, and, and position your life for wisdom and revelation, here it is. Write it down. Number one, I need to admit my weaknesses honestly. I need to admit my weaknesses honestly. If I don't admit my weaknesses, I can't work on my weaknesses. All right, if I'm acting like they're not there, then I can't really address the issues that I'm pretending don't exist. Proverbs 29 says, A man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. But if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets another chance. Some of you have heard about that teenage boy who admitted to his sister that he had, he said, I have, I have the sin of vanity in my, in my heart. Not, I just need to confess. And she says, vanity? How do you have, how do you have the sin of vanity in your heart? He says, because every time I go by a mirror, I think, man, you are good looking. What a stud. And she goes, and she goes man, that's not vanity. That's ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know some of you might pray like this. You might pray, God, if I've sinned today... Please forgive me. Trust me. You don't have to say if. It's there. It's, 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 it's happening. You have weaknesses and faults and failures. Some of you say, when I confess to God, I just can't think of anything to confess. Just start guessing. You're going to land on something. <laughs> Humility starts by being honest about my weaknesses. I don't have it all together, and neither do you. None of us are perfect. N- none of us are. We're all growing. Here's the second way we develop humility, and that is I need to evaluate my strengths realistically. I need to evaluate my strengths realistically. Pride is based on a false evaluation of ourselves, right? An inflated view of ourselves. One person said, we, we look at other people through, the, through a microscope, but then when we look at ourselves, we look at everyone through the wrong end of the microscope, and we see ours, all issues so far away and so minute Pride is this inflated in view of ourselves. Humility is based on truth and realism. And when you know the truth, it will set you free. Romans chapter 12, verse 3 says, Don't cherish, I love this, don't cherish exaggerated ideas of yourself or your importance. But try to have a sane estimate of your capabilities, a realistic evaluation. Humility doesn't mean that you think bad about yourself. Humility doesn't say like, oh man, I'm nothing. I'm terrible. I'm no good. No, you are something. You were created by God. God has given you gifts and talents and abilities. You are unique. God has made you that way. You have strengths. You got them from God. You have talents. 
You're very talented in some areas. I'm very talented in some areas. And I'm very weak in other areas, too. I heard about this little girl. She went into the Dewar's ice cream shop, and she ordered a whole pint of ice cream. And the, wait, the, the waiter said, honey, are you sure you can eat this whole thing? And she says, oh, yes, I'm much, much bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. <laughs> Kids say the cutest thing. Isn't that funny? But pride, pride says, pride sa- likes to act like we're, we're m- much bigger on the outside than we are on the inside. See, pride likes to put on like I'm a man of faith. Pride likes to put on like I got a character and maturity and anointing when inside you haven't paid the price. When inside we're, we're small. Galatians 6 says each man should test his own actions. You, you, you need to have a regular evaluation time where you're looking to see what's inside, like about your weaknesses and realistic about your strengths. He said each man should do that. Each man should have an evaluation time. Each man should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. Now, he's not talking about the wrong kind of pride there. There is a, there is a good kind of pride and a wrong, bad kind of pride. He's talking about the self-esteem kind of the satisfaction in life. You know, you can take pride in, in, in a job well done. You can take pride in that. You go mow your lawn after you haven't mowed it like in, you know, all year, <laughs> right? And after you're done, you're like, oh yeah, I'm the man of the house, right? Yeah. You can take pride in a job well done. But notice the danger. He says, you can take pride in yourself as long as you don't compare. Don't compare yourself to somebody else. There are two problems every time we do this, every time we fall into this trap of competition and comparison, which is another form of pride. There, there are two traps. When we do, when, when, every time we do this, we'll, every time we try to compare with someone else, we will always find somebody who's not doing it as well as us. And it'll inflate us full of pride. But also when we look around and compare, we will also find somebody who's doing it better than us. And it'll fill, fill us full of discouragement. Don't compare yourself to anyone, he says. The Bible says it's dumb to compare yourself. Don't do it. You are unique. The Bible says you were created unique by God. No one else can be you. No one else. Just like the snowflake. There are no two snowflakes that are alike. You are made unique. And if you don't be you, who in the world is going to be you? God made you unique. Don't compare yourself to other people. But in our nation, where there's so much, it's just built on competition almost, it's hard, isn't it, to not compete in life. It is. It's hard to not compare. It's hard to not compete. But if you want to be free from pride, you, you need to take pride in who you are in Christ and what you are in Christ and what God is doing in your own life in the season he's doing it and stop comparing your season with somebody else's season. Amen, Pastor. Man, this is a lot better than you guys are responding again. This is, is it the series? Is it the series a little bit hard on you? So how do you become humble and happy? Position. You need to position yourself for wisdom and revelation. You need to admit your weaknesses. You need to have that honest assessment with with yourself. Be transparent. What you see is what you get. I need to evaluate my strengths realistically. I'm good at some things, but I'm not good at everything. Then there's a third way to develop humility in our lives. Write it down. I need to enjoy my success gratefully. I need to enjoy my success gratefully to have this attitude of gratitude. And this is, this is where the trap becomes difficult because um, when, you are, when, when you are positioning yourself with humility and wisdom, and now God is giving you wisdom and revelation and promotion, and he's elevating you because, because of your posture of your heart, you're going to get promoted, okay? You're going to get blessed, you're going to fall into favor with God, and then there comes the test. Do you, do you enjoy your successes gratefully and give it back to God, or do you point it back to you? Will pride be found in our heart when God elevates us and promotes us and blesses us because of our humility, or do we, do we begin to think it's all because of us? Prideful people usually think they deserve what is good, and they're not thankful for what they have. In fact, they, they, they think they even deserve better, so they're like, I'm not going to, why do I have to be gratitude for this? I deserve even better than, than this. I deserve more than this. They tend to be critical, complaining, and discontent. 
The proud person is not in the practice of thanking God or, or thanking other people. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 says, What are you so puffed up about? Why, what do you have that God hasn't given you? And if it's all, if all you have is from God, why act as though you have accomplished something on your own? Everything you have comes from God. You don't have anything that wasn't from God. Oh, I built this business, Pastor. You don't know. I built this business with my own two hands. Where'd you get those hands? But I had this idea myself. I thought, where'd you get a mind from to think clearly? Everything you have comes from God. Everything you have is a gift from God. What you do with that gift is your gift back to God. Okay? James says in verse, chapter 1, verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father. When you realize in your success that it all comes from God, you realize, man, I have talent, I have ability, I, I do work hard, I do, I do have energy to, to, to use, but it, the bottom line, the source of my success is God. It's God. So if you want to develop humility, I need to enjoy my success because you posture yourself for humility, I'm telling you, God is going to, God will, he, he's going to make you successful. He's going to elevate you. And when that happens, you need to have a spirit of gratitude and understand the source of your success is God. Here's number four, to develop humility in your life. Number four, I need to serve others unselfishly. To serve others unselfishly. A lot of us did this. I mean, you want to develop humility in your life. Man, you need to get some of this in your life. Yesterday was serve day. Uh, about 300 of us served, 1,000, I would imagine. Over 1,000 people just yesterday it was awesome. I talked to all of them right here, and I told them, hey, we are going out with no strings attached. We're not, we're not saying, come to our church. We're not giving them a flyer. It will null and void everything we've done. We're just going out to share the love and the kindness of Christ and pr being prayerful that God opens opportunities to minister, minister and have ministry with people. But there is no strings attached. I'm telling you, if you want to break the spirit of pride from your life, you need to get some of that in your life. You need to serve other people unselfishly. There's been a lot of studies, a lot of articles recently about, about depression in our culture. It's, it's at the highest rate ever in recorded history. Depression, there was an article out of the LA Times called Studies uh, That Find Depression Epidemic in Young Adults, LA Times. It says, the rate of mental depression in the United States has risen dramatically over the past 30 years. People born in the last 30 years face three to 10 times the risk of major depression than their grandparents did. Why? The epidemic is traced to historical and cultural occurrences that have exalted the individual. So we're living in the me generation. What's best for me? I don't care about everyone else. It's just was best for me, my goals, my agenda, my vision, my passion, my dreams, my desires. Pride and selfishness cause depression. He calls it in this article, he calls it the, the California self. An exalted, an exalted entity whose pleasures and pains, successes and failures occupy center stage. Where can one turn now for identity, satisfaction and hope? To a very small and frail unit indeed, yourself. When I live for only me, I'm asking for depression. I found another article in, the, in Psychology Today. That one's targeting young adults. This one kind of hits the boomers. If you're over 50, it's the boomer blues is what it's called. Psychology Today. Boomer blues. Talking about depression among baby boomers. With two great expectations, the baby boomers are sliding into individualistic, individualistic melancholy. Just as belief in the nation was crumbling and belief in God was also fading, the skyrocketing divorce rate eroded belief in the family as well. When people no longer believe that their country is powerful and benevolent and that the family can be a source of enduring unity and support or that a relationship with God is important, where else can they turn for identity, satisfaction, and hope? People then only have one alternative to turn to themselves and that's what's causing depression in America. What LA Times and Psychology Today are talking about is something that's been talking about in the Bible 2,000 years ago, Philippians chapter 2. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. You ever think about if we took God's word literally, like what would actually happen to our life? We're like, this is literal. I have to, 
do nothing. So every goal that you have, every ambition that you have, everything that you set on your agenda of your life, your to-do list, he says, just make sure the heart that it's coming from is not selfish, that it doesn't point back to you, that, that, that it doesn't the motivate, what's, check the motivation of every decision that you're making. Do nothing, nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But here's the word, in humility. Consider others better than yourselves. Not only looking, look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. Your attitude should be that, the same as Jesus Christ. Our model for this, our model for serving others unselfishly is Jesus Christ. He didn't have anything to prove, did he? And because of that, because he didn't have anything to prove, he then was free to serve unselfishly, to serve others. Insecure people can't serve others. They're too worried about their own needs. And prideful people are so busy thinking of themselves, so we focus on the needs of others. I'm telling you, this is one of the, one of the biggest, most effective ways to break pride from your life is to serve others unselfishly. Get that in your life. Here's the final piece of advice I have for you, and that is humble yourself voluntarily. I need to humble myself voluntarily. Listen, because you can either, you can either humble yourself or God will humble you. That's the two options you have, and I need to humble myself well, humility is a choice. The word here is a, is a verb. It's something you do. You take action. You, I read all throughout the scriptures, there's never one place where we're supposed to pray and ask God for humility. Humility is something you choose, you act on. Look at James chapter 4. He says, humble yourselves. Like you need to make a choice today. You need, to, you need to make some action. You need to do something today. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. It's, it's a way of choosing the way I think, I act, I respond to others, the things I say. It's a choice. And then there's this promise. He says, if you humble yourself, God will lift you up. That is a paradox. God is saying the way up is down. The way up is down. The more I humble myself, the more God lifts me up. The more I am honest about my weaknesses and grateful about God's successes and recognizing where that source is, the more God is going to elevate me the more God is going to lift me up. But the opposite is also true. He says the way up is down, and the way down is up. Proverbs 16, pride goes before destruction. And a haughty spirit, that prideful spirit, goes before a fall. The moment I start getting filled with pride, I'm setting myself up for a fall. The moment I think I have it all together, I'm ready for it. The moment, I, the moment I start pretending like it's all okay when really inside I'm hurting or really at home I'm suffering or really it's, it's not okay and I'm at the end of the moment I start to pretend and put on and be phony, God says you're headed for a fall. You're about to crumble. The cure for pride, not in your notes, but if you, you want to be broken from the spirit of pride, here it is. You may want to write this down. Here's the cure for pride to discover how much God really loves me will cure the pride of every heart. To discover how God really loves me. How does that cure your pride? Because beneath, beneath your pride, beneath our pride, is, is humongous, massive insecurity and inferiority and inadequacy. When I act like I'm the big shot, it's because inside I'm feeling small. When I act overconfident, it's because inside I'm scared, I'm trembling, I'm afraid. When I act like I got it all together, it's because inside I'm falling apart. And I, and I don't want you to see me how I see me and know me, so I need, to, I need to put on and put up a front. But when you experience the love of God, no matter where you are, no matter what you've done, it sets you free to be honest with God who loves you and who knows you, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and it sets you free to be honest with others because of your standing with God. Come on, let's, let's bow our heads in prayer together. I mean, that's where I'd like to